Welcome to the Quantum Feedback Loop podcast. I'm your host, James Myers, and I also publish the Quantum Record, which features the latest in science and technology. It was an honor to welcome Saima Fancy to the podcast to speak about privacy on the road to artificial general intelligence that many are seeking to develop. The power and reach of artificial intelligence demand that we understand its consequences to human privacy. As profit-driven businesses are racing ahead in the quest for AGI, there's a real need for a global conversation on the issues. But the discussion has been fractured by the rapid pace of change and the complexities involved. Putting the questions into a human context is critical to engaging the input of global citizens. And this is why it was such a pleasure to speak with Saima. With two decades of experience as a privacy specialist, coinciding with the explosion of AI and our reliance on technology for so many aspects of daily living, Saima takes a remarkably engaging and philosophical approach to the issues. Why does privacy matter? It's the question that began and ended our discussion. When many of us feel we have no choice except to agree to pages long, legally dense user agreements for the applications we depend on, Saima frames the importance of privacy in the context of our human relationship with AI that's designed by humans. What I found particularly striking and empowering to us as humans was Saima's statement about the way that some people use AI to amplify disharmony among us. As Saima said, artificial intelligence is not a threat just in and of itself, it's a threat because humanity's ugliness has surfaced. What we were hiding away has now surfaced, and that's what human beings are having issues contending with. Because at the end of the day, large language models, generative AI at large, these tools are developed by humans to manipulate humans. The drivers are still humans, and we forget that. It's not an alien that just embarked upon us from outer space. I came away from my discussion with Saima feeling more informed and empowered with an understanding of the issues, and I hope you do too. So here's my conversation with Saima Fancy. Well, welcome, Saima, to the Quantum Feedback Loop podcast. Really looking forward to discussing with you the rapidly evolving world of privacy and technology and how it affects us. So welcome. Oh, thank you so much. So happy to be here. Can you start by telling us a little bit about the work that you're doing now and what it was that got you on the path to privacy in your career? Yeah, for sure. So I currently work as a senior privacy specialist um, in my current role in the healthcare space in Ontario. Um, I consider myself a privacy engineer, and I'll, I'll get to the understanding of why I have that title associated with myself. Started off as a chemical engineer, and I've got a degree in um, so combined chemical engineering and biochemistry. Uh, went off to the world of consulting within the engineering space. Um, we had the um, commercial sector of the world hire us via lawyers, uh, litigation lawyers on Bay Street with regards to making massive uh, purchases of pulp and paper mills, gas stations, whatnot, and we engineers would go in and see if these those purchases would be viable, would be feasible based on our uh, assessments. While I was doing that, I fell in love with law um, and uh, getting to know all these lawyers. And I was really curious, piqued my interest. And I thought, you know what, let me go try and see what's happening over there. So a few years later, became a scientific legal advisor to a few lawyers and started deconstructing their medical malpractice and civil litigation uh, uh, suits and um, would work on their diagnostics and drawn uh, on top of them such that they were real evidence and could be submitted into court. So one could disseminate something uh, like what's a commutative fracture of a left tibia, you know, so the such as jury members could understand, have a common understanding, break down the semantics such that everyone could be on the same page and to facilitate the case and expedite uh, settlement. So that went off swimmingly well until I started missing engineering again. So did that for quite some time. I went all the way to Supreme Court of Canada with lawyers. I've been told that I've litigated without being a litigator <laughs> more times than uh, quite a few folks out there. Um, went back into engineering again and ran a pressure sensitive manufacturing facility up here in Northern Ontario running 24 seven, where we would basically produce pressure sensitive labels for hospitals and labs all across uh, the country. And it became a 24 seven shift. And that was great because got back to my machinery and my tooling and my computer know-how. And I love that. And also learned how to run a business. So entrepreneurship came in, uh, learned how to deal with bankers and uh, customers and marketers and whatnot, which was fascinating. Again, I was not happy uh, completely. And uh, there was a missing piece. And that's when I discovered data privacy and cybersecurity. And that was it. Uh, I, I just thought I'd lend it with all the interests that I have of life sciences, applied sciences, law, and philanthropy and philosophy, because one has to be driven to do what one does. 
if uh, eight to 10 hours of video are being consumed by, by initiatives such as that. And so I thought, you know, this, this is amazing, protecting people's data. Uh, it's a sensitive asset of ours. I, I would love to dive into that. And um, hence, that's what I did. Quit my job, started studying, got a whole bunch of certifications. And, and that was that. Got involved with the Ministry of Health, learned how to not only manage data from an engineering perspective, but also from a policy and lawmaking perspective. How do you change policy such that you can enact regulations and eventually um, drive that into law? So that was fascinating. But use both my legal and uh, engineering background to the private sector, further di diving deep into data management and uh, got a bunch of certifications in privacy engineering, Carnegie Mellon University being one of them. Love, love that school. And uh, landed a position at Twitter uh, as a privacy and security engineer. And uh, that was such a fun ride until, well, the world knows what happened. <laughs> Mr. Musk had alternative ideas. <laughs> And um, yeah, hence began the journey of where I am today. That's a really fascinating combination, actually, of you know, private industry experience, law, policy making, in government as well, that you've seen it from all of those angles, like over how many years? I'm just trying to... Over two decades. Two decades, well. Wow. This yeah. evolution has occurred, yes. Yeah. And I find that I'm not the only engineer who has been evolving as such. A few of my friends and colleagues who are engineers as well, we're constantly looking for that perfect sweet spot of where we can gel all our knowledge bases and skill sets together. And I've, I've landed, I've landed quite yeah. sweetly. Interesting. And, and I mean, that's certainly the period where there had been so many privacy concerns develop over the, and, and so much action over the, over two decades. It's, and, and I want to talk about, you know, where all of this is headed. Um, but I think before that, I want to just, you know, frame it for the listeners as to the question, why does privacy matter? I mean, I, I continually hear, and I heard it, in fact, just from a friend two weeks ago, I think, who, who said, well, why should I be concerned about privacy? And then mm -hmm. when, I, when I responded about my concerns, the answer was sort of, well, what do you have to hide? Like, I'm a little bit concerned that you have something to hide. Uh, why should people be concerned about their privacy? Oh, so, so it, it's, the, it's the penultimate question, isn't it? drives me bonkers. It, it, it does drive me mad. You're, one is correct. Our data is out there. Our information is out there quite unwillingly without our consent. Yes, it's happened. But with the onset of AI tools at the evolutionary space that these tools are developing, I think we have more and more concerns to be as private as possible. Why give out willingly your data knowing that there's technology out there that can misuse it and you hold it against you. You could be pinned to a crime nowadays that you have were never within the vicinity of, right? So my counter argument to that argument is what's out there is out there. Try not to give your fingerprints, your DNA, your biometrics of any sort. Don't, don't go and do gen genetic testing. First of all, you didn't get consent from your grandparents who've already gone, your cousins and your aunts and your uncles. And, but secondly, that data is out there and that will get leaked. And we already know from companies I will not name that that data has been infiltrated by nefarious actors. So why do that? One willingly gave away their sample of their a tissue of their cheeks or their saliva, right? So I'm, I, what I'm saying is whatever control you have, take that back, please, from industry at large, knowing that there is valid and viable threats out there. Are there any specific cases? I mean, I, th I think you mentioned the 23andMe case, the DNA sharing, or not sharing, that was hacked. That was uh, hacked, yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I guess, you know, when I choose to keep certain things private, whether it's my bank account, details or whether it's my credit card number or whether it's my email contents or whether it's my private thoughts about whether I like somebody or dislike somebody. I kind of think of this as I'm an agent in time. Like I'm able to control if I want that information to become public and when I want it to become public. And then when that decision is taken away from me, I, I become not an actor. I become uh, you know, somebody who is subject to other persons uh, and other person's right. actions. And you've cited some cases. I don't know if you can provide any other specific examples of, you know, either some things that you've come across or just well-publicized cases, but how do we get the message across to people who are so used to um, having their data taken and they don't know where it's going, but 
I think there's just this general sense that there's nothing I can do about it. And so I just have to accept what it is. Yeah, that kind of doomsday thinking is what's the, the first that needs to go. I think the crux of it is something that just passion that, that's that's true to you and to myself, and which is why we connected, is that it comes down to education, right? And it should start at an elementary school level. We hand our children those cell phones the minute that they know how to navigate the apps, right? I've seen one-year-olds just go flick, 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 and they know where they want to go right away. And, and that's frightening. You give them this these tools without the education of what the ramifications of using those tools are. I mean, you wouldn't give a baby a scissor, would you, right? Or a knife. So why do we hand them our cell phones just like that? It's out of pure laziness, frustration, because we don't want to deal with this child who's screaming away and whatnot. So I'm, I'm saying it goes back to fundamentals. Let's educate the populace at large and let's start early. Let's get them to understand why you should not light fire just like that randomly without having a purpose for it, right? We have to come down to the basics, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing any trend developing in terms of consumer education? You know, our... No, not so much so, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, there yeah. are a lot of free courses out there that vendors are offering, like Google, Microsoft, and whatnot. I wish people would take advantage of them. But the issue is that um, the, the population at large is, is afraid of understanding, I think almost, is afraid of diving in. I don't know how to make that more available, readily available, except perhaps to break it down even to further little, little sound bites and bite-sized pieces. Um, yeah, it's a tough one. It's a tough conundrum. And then the other thing is to get the population to understand what does it mean to analyze data? What what are statistics? What are probabilities? I mean, it comes down to mathematics and so many people are averse to that as well. And again, that goes back to our the failure of our education system. I mean, to understand technology today, one must have an appreciation to a certain extent of math. And math is taught so poorly in our schools. The whole AI revolution that we're going through right now is, I think, should cause a shift or a reshift of that mindset and go back and, and level set and say, how are we teaching these children? Because what we have is dysfunctionality that's propagating at an exponential rate because of lack of education. Yeah, and what you say about math is very interesting because I had a discussion for the podcast uh, a few months ago with Dr. John Mighton, who's the founder of Jump Math. And one of the topics he discussed was- I heard was, your podcast there, yeah. <laughs> great thing. Yeah. And, and, you know, he discussed the idea of understanding probabilities and in a technological world, it's so important to do that. And yet we don't really know that. And so I guess educating the consumer is one thing. I was going to ask, are there any evolving, generally accepted standards in privacy, either in academia or industry or government? I mean, say I say I'm hired as a software engineer at a company and my job is to design or implement privacy standards for whatever products they have. What guidance do I have in that role? Is, is there any generally accepted standards that are evolving in that? Yeah, so we do have our laws, right? Albeit they are old and pre-internet, at least in Canada. And um, uh, they are evolving and there's second reading of those acts happening before they become law within parliament. Um, so, that, so that's good to know how long that will take. I couldn't tell you because you know how these things uh, run. But in terms of how one could do it within their company, a good company will have policies and procedures to follow. And those policies and procedures should be based on some common understood global standards out there like the NIST standard. If you're in cybersecurity, it would be the SOC 2, the ISO standards that apply for both security and for privacy. Um, then you've got the EU AI Act. There are robust pieces of standards and laws out there, GDPR is out there. Just because we don't have it in Canada and the US doesn't mean we shouldn't use that as a precedence, right? If uh, with good companies that are being mindful, they are using these laws and, and standards to develop their own internal privacy policies and procedures, which thereby the software engineer can use to do their design work. Then there has to be accountability held, uh, uh, sorry, implemented within companies as well, right? It goes all the way up to leadership and then trickles down and then goes laterally within the corp. So back to education piece there as well to embed that culture, that line of thinking within a corporation so it runs wisely and doesn't run into trouble with the FTC in the US or with the ICO in, in the EU, right? And have punitive damages smashed up against their heads, so to speak, because they're coming down hard. 
Actually, interesting. You mentioned the FTC because I was doing a little bit of research for an article that I'm writing and just came across a blog warning that they posted last week. I think it was on February 13th, advising AI and other companies that are trying to increase their data collection that, quote, quietly changing your terms of services. Your, I saw that. Quietly and changing your, your terms of service yep. could be unfair or deceptive. Yeah. And, and exactly. I'm wondering, is this a sign of a fundamental shift? I think so. It's, it's a good sign too. And with their uh, the one punitive um, uh, measure that they have of algorithmic disgorgement, I mean, this is a really good sign because that one is huge. I mean, the minute the FTC, which it has, told some surveillance companies, that's it, get rid of that algorithm, everything's gone, the data's gone, it's all gone. And companies can't afford to do that, right? Uh, how are they going to enforce I don't know, because those privacy policies are insane. They're huge. They are not written such that the average person can understand. They're usually written at a grade eight level or higher. The average American reads between grade three and five level. You know, so the awareness is great. How are you going to implement and guard? I I, I don't know. But at mm -hmm. least at least the conversations have begun. I wonder, and, and I've advocated for this in uh, in an editorial I wrote a few months back, is there any discussion about developing some sort of international standards for privacy agreements, such as, you know, there are international standards for a wide number of agreements, uh, international trade, there are agreements relating to letters of credit, there's, you know, international standards for a lot of these things. It seems to me, you know, as you say, I, I mean, and, and I'm guilty of this as, as much as anybody else, when I want to use a new software tool, you're presented with this long, long, long agreement, it goes on for pages and pages and pages and contains all sorts of legalese. And I would say maybe, you know, 0.1% of users actually read part of it. And, and I have read parts of some of these, but right. honestly, who has the time and who understands really what it's saying? So you know, it seems to me it would be very helpful if there was some international standard that would say at least, you know, here's the high risk areas yeah. uh, and, you know, at least understand these areas. One of the reasons I chose to go to Carnegie Mellon University to do my certifications was because they are working on something along the lines of what you're mentioning. Um, Lori Craner and Norman Sade, professors that I hold in high, high regard, are working on creating something called recipe cards um, that would be standardized, if not in North America, but it would globally on how to miniaturize these policies and procedures such that one can consume them very readily and without having to have, uh, you know, a, a huge semantic knowledge. So there's there's a lot of work being done, and CMU is not the only university working on that. There's some in the U, in the EU as well, and there there is collaboration happening in the background. I think that's very exciting research. Um, how far along everyone is, I've kind of lost track of, of that, but but there is that happening. And if if that happens, and they all come together and do collaborate as well as I think they are right now, can you imagine that would be game changing? because that would just bring it down to small, small visual pieces that um, people could consume quickly. The other is the opt-in, opt-out um, conversion that needs to occur. You US and the EU are not aligned in that, right? GDPR is saying, make that clear. Don't create dark patterns as to how one could opt in to, to consenting to usage of certain sites in the, in the US and Canada. It's still pretty nefarious in how companies go about that. So that needs to be standardized. Once that's standardized as well globally, I think we can get into a lot better spaces and there's work being done on it. Mm -hmm. that, that's encouraging and interesting to know that work is being done on that. Yes. And I guess the other encouraging thing that I'm seeing in respect to, I guess it's a response to GDPR as well as the EU AI Act is now when I go onto a website, I am pretty almost always asked about cookies acceptance. Whereas before the default was that you had to accept all cookies. Um, and I think most people don't understand the danger of third-party cookies and how much information is tracked using third-party cookies under these data sharing agreements with Google and other companies. Um, so I guess it's in the sense that even if uh, certain jurisdictions legislation isn't up to speed, you know, say in North America, we're behind Europe, perhaps the the fact that a lot of these international businesses are doing business in Europe, that they are now extending their agreement requirements and disclosures to a worldwide population according to the higher standards. 
Agreed. And and you're right, GDPR being the golden standard that it is, globally speaking, is driving that conversation. So it, it is a huge continent. And there's 27 member countries as part of the EU, right? If the corporations uh, like the Googles and the Metas of the world at large want to do business there and they are there, they will have to comply with the GDPR. And the two countries, have, meaning EU and US, have to have adequacy to be able to do data transfers between them. If that adequacy doesn't occur, well, that affects your, your bottom dollar, right? And nobody wants economics, geopolitical matters affected as such. So the EU essentially, the ICO essentially is causing the rest of the world to behave themselves, which, which is excellent. And that's what's driving the conversation in the right direction, both with regards to data privacy, cybersecurity, and also now with AI, right, in the mix. You've seen that California is saying, look, US, we're not waiting for you to do anything federally speaking. We're going to create our own AI piece of legislation. And they're doing that. The CCPA, the CPRA, robust baby GDPRs, they're driving the conversation in the US. So things are happening. Canada needs to catch up big time. Our AI uh, conversation is falling through the cracks. So we had IDA, which was the third bill, part of the new uh, framework that's going through Parliament right now, is falling through the cracks. We will maybe look at it again in 2025. So right now it's the wild, wild west here. It's like driving a car on the highway without any rules and regulations. So you can drive whichever the way you want, go whichever the way you want. That's how I see this space. It's insane. We need rules and regulations, but we also have an issue of, again, back to lack of education. We've got regulators who don't understand technology. There's a huge divide. There's a huge gap between technological understanding and legal understanding, right? We need to we need to bring them together. We need uh, regulators who are technologists and we need technologists who are regulators. And that's why privacy engineering is such an exciting field for me because we can talk the talk. We can close that loop, we can close that circle, we communicate really well. We can talk to the customer, the marketer, the, the legal department, the privacy department, the cyber department, the engineering department, right? And we need more of these kinds of folks to close that loop. Yeah, and I think the the pace at which these new tools are evolving, I mean, you mentioned the evolution of tools at the beginning, the pace at which these new tools are evolving is much faster, I think, than the normal legislative pace. And, and even if the legislators we're up to speed on what's happening. And I think there's, you know, some pretty public examples, uh, I think of some congressional hearings in the U S perhaps of how they're not up to speed on what's happening. Uh, even if they were up to speed, you know, the, the legislative process is so much slower than, than the industrial process, I guess. And that's a, a problem, I guess, that we're going to face for a long time. We are, unfortunately, I mean, I, I laugh at how, how legislators work. I mean, First of all, they need to cut their vacation time down. It can't be three, four months long, right? I mean, the world is still revolving and evolving. Uh, again, what what artificial intelligence, the onset of all these tools has done to me is causing a shift in the way we have constructed our society, uh, philosophically, sociologically, um, economically, from so many different aspects. And we, why human beings are afraid of it is because we are being forced forced to shift that line of thinking. And if we don't, we are looking at a chasm here. We're looking at the onset of some, some perhaps not ap apocalyptic <laughs> uh, outcomes, but definitely uh, some, some downfalls. And artificial intelligence is not a threat just in, of it, in and of itself. It's a threat because humanity's ugliness has surfaced, right? Um, what we were hiding away is now surfaced. And that's what human beings are having issues contending with. Because at the end of the day, LLMs, um, Gen AI at large, these tools are developed by humans to manipulate humans. The drivers are still humans and we forget that. It's not an alien that just embarked upon us from outer space, right? Um, how that's gonna happen, I, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, it, it's it really- down to philosophical uh, quagmire here. For sure, I mean, and, and you know, our, pursuit of self-interest, I guess, some are better at constraining that than others. And certainly technology gives an avenue for people who want to abuse it to abuse it. And we've seen I'm highly saying. publicized, yeah, highly publicized cases. I want to actually go back, you know, you mentioned economic interests in this, and I want to go back to the question of why does privacy matter because of the question of data brokering. It's a huge industry. Yes. Not not well publicized, and and there's a reason I think that it's not well publicized because of what they do. 
uh, massive amounts of money traded uh, by data brokers on data that they're buying and selling on us. We don't know how it's being used. We don't know how it's being collected. Uh, but there are some well-publicized cases. I mean, there was, for example, a um, Roman Catholic priest in the U.S. whose uh, social connection app was hacked and and they were able to track his activities and he was forced to leave the priesthood as a result. Um, and so, you know, there's cases like that that are clearly abusive, but you know, I don't know. Have you have you done any work specifically on data brokering and its consequences? Uh, not directly, but I know quite about it. Um, Target was another case that was notorious with regards to it about a young girl, 16 year old who was pregnant, didn't want to tell her parents and her parents found it out through all the ad targeting that was being done upon the family. Um, governments themselves are involved in this kind of brokerage business where they are were buying data during COVID as onset uh, from uh, um, telco companies and using that data to track their citizens as to how people were traveling within the country, across the countries, where did they have COVID, how was that being transmitted and all that without consent. Right. So that's all being um, unearthed now. Companies like Clearview are being held accountable. They left Canada, for example, and they're in a lot of trouble in a lot of states in the U.S. for selling um, uh, surveillance data to cops, for example, um, private investigators and how that's being misused. So it's it's happening. The public is getting to become more aware Um but we're being surveilled like crazy everywhere, every intersection. I was in New York just a couple of months ago attending a Women in AI conference, and it was amazing to see the cameras every which way. Same thing when I was in San Francisco for the engineering conference uh, last fall. Everywhere, cameras, police, um, the surveillance was uncanny. Um, but we, we can't get away from that. Uh, countries like China, surveillance your, your biometrics are your currency aren't they you can't purchase anything without having your eyeballs available and your fingerprints available and your credit ratings match to your biometrics we are headed for that in, in in the western world if we're not already there it could be that we are there and we just don't know right mm -hmm. and you mentioned clearview the facial recognition data and that's, you know, in another example, uh, you know, there was a case, uh, again, I think it was some years ago, but actually not, maybe not that long ago, where the police arrived at somebody's door thinking that this person had committed a crime and it was based on face recognition data. But this data uh, is especially prone to error with people of color, um, minority groups, um, but even, even the majority population. So, you know, it, and yet they're I, I'm reading that they're going to be rolling out face recognition uh, procedures in airports, I think, in the U.S. Uh, so well, we're doing it right. I was yeah. uh, just went to Princeton, New Jersey a couple of weeks ago for a wet yeah. wedding. My my retina was scanned. I, yeah. I couldn't enter. And I asked um, the agent there, I said, uh, do I have an option not to do it? He said, sure. Then you don't get to go through. So really, that's not an option, is it? Not an option, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you talk about data. It's a gigo situation, garbage in, garbage out. And I'm just finishing reading this book, uh, Unmasking AI by, by Dr. Joy Bowani. And um, she being um, of a, a Black American descent, um, embarked on how these tools didn't recognize her face for facial recognition purposes mm -hmm. because of her skin, skin color. But that's a huge issue, right? And that goes back down to then, back to the surveillance economy, how are all these data sets being classified? Where are they being classified? And there's a full um, issue there because how do you, how does an AI decipher a cat from a dog from a from a baseball, right? And even within dogs, how does it decide between a schnauzer and a and a hound and and whatnot? Those classifications need to be done. And where are those being done? Well, those are being done in poor countries, right? You're going to the villages of India and the Philippines and Peru, and people are being hired who can't speak English and are being given data. Um, at large and being are asking them to, to to be labeled and being paid very very little and so so there's so there's that element of it and then there's the issue of the amount of data they're being exposed to pornography and violence and whatnot and the ramifications of that right so this this is data colonization happening at large 
there's so much to unpack over there in terms of data ethics behind data and AI tooling using that that, that, that alone could could cause one to do a PhD on, right? <laughs> But um, yeah, it is, there's a lot to, to deal with, with data quality issues mm -hmm. and data utility issues as well. Mm -hmm. Classification is an interesting issue. And I'm just wondering, is there any coordinated effort to look at data classification problems and procedures? I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of that horrible case in 2015 when Google's algorithms labeled two black people as gorillas. And so then since then, um, there's been awareness of this. And so there's been efforts to go and change the algorithms to specifically uh, prevent classifications of gorillas uh, or, or, you know, to really constrain the classification of anything involving the word gorilla or any sort of uh, uh, monkey-like animal. But as a result, now the classifications of animals has the uh, accuracy of the classification has now decreased. So, yeah. you know, we, we try so to utility is compromised. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and so is there any work being done on this whole area of classification? As you mentioned, I mean, we're shipping off data to these other countries, paying people low wages to classify data, and these classifications are having real ramifications on people's lives. Yeah, I I don't know offhand. I haven't I haven't dived into that area yet, but right now the economy is such that the data data um discovery economy is such that this work is still being subbed out to third world or developing nations. I hate using that term to developing nations where English is the second or third language of people being recruited to classify, categorize this data. And uh, hence that whole um, problem is just still being amplified. I don't know if work being done. That doesn't mean it, is, it isn't, but um, the problem has been at least uh, brought to surface. Mm -hmm. And can you imagine with self-supervised learning how that problem is amplifying, right? Yeah. Um, not only are these tools uh, essentially um, ravaging data off the off the web, but it's generating based on that data, and then it's just amplifying further and further. I mean, yeah. what can we believe anymore? It, yeah. It's so difficult. Yeah. And this is going back to your original question at the beginning of our conversation, protect thyself as much as thy can, because if you don't, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's all being generated, isn't it? But at least you can, you can exercise some level of control to the mm -hmm. extent that you can. And, and I want to get into that uh, whole, this path towards uh, artificial general intelligence. You know, I guess the idea that uh, AGI will be able to, uh, I guess, you know, there's multiple definitions of AGI, but I think maybe incorporated in all of them is the idea that the, intelligence will be able to apply abstract or, or apply ab abstractions whereas ai now is you know generally you know specifics it's there's a specific path between input and output whereas agi would have an abstract path between input and output and so i wanted to explore that maybe but before we get into that you know because you've been in the industry for two decades i just wanted your general impression on you know, the overall, the, the big picture changes over that two decade period in terms of privacy, like two decades ago, when you started, you know, kind of where was the privacy discussion at that point? And then how's it evolved to the point that it's at today? Yeah, it's it's interesting, because cell phones were just coming about as well, right? Internet had just come in, I mean, I'm dating myself, yeah. but boy, has it evolved at a warp speed. I mean, my exposure to privacy was within the healthcare space where you had to sign a waiver, you had to sign consent forms to get medical information on the clients and whatnot. But it's just evolved within the last five to 10 years in an insane manner. And um, the space has become convoluted and very nuanced and it needs more and more professionals, especially those who are bringing a plethora of disciplines in their, in their pocket, right? We need people who are not singular in by way of academia and work experience. We need people who are philosophers, philanthropists, thinkers, those who can ask the right questions, those who understand law and science and communications, right? Um, that's how this space is evolving. 
it's becoming multidisciplinary and it needs folks who are coming from the liberal arts and the applied sciences together. I was, you know, I always, always, always criticize universities for having evolved to where we are today. I mean, gone are the days from the, um, the Aristotelian times where you went to university to study all not just the liberal arts. You didn't divide yourself up into different disciplines. You didn't just study economics. You didn't just study science. You studied all disciplines because together they made you a whole, right? We need to go back to that. Again, I go back to education. We need to go back to engineers studying philosophy, engineers studying music and, and English literature, right? And vice versa. It's because our space, our social space has become so dynamic and, and, and evolved. And, and, you know, the world is more interconnected than I think it's probably ever been, right? It's, and, and so, and so, as you say, to not think about all of these interconnections and to just focus on one narrow area is not going to get us to where we need. I mean, I guess the economic incentive for that is difficult. You know, somebody wants a job, they know that a certain industry pays well, yes. uh, and they'll train for that job as a result. But what's the incentive for somebody to go and get that broad education when they don't know necessarily, they can't point to it, well, it's going to produce this kind of pay scale in three years. Yeah. What's the incentive? I mean, it's kind of unfair. You're right. It's unfair that I just made the statement that I did. It's a fantastical statement that I made. Mm -hmm. It takes one to, to understand the, the discrepancies within our society and community at large, and not everyone can do that. A lot of people have to pay bills, put food on the table, and whatever it takes to get that done, they'll do it. I mean, if they were to speak to me, they'd say, Saima, you've lost your mind. We don't have time for this kind of thinking or pursuing multidisciplines within our careers. No, I need to go to work nine to five, come home, make dinner, pay the bills, and feed my kids. I mean, that's the state of most human beings, and um, and and that's okay, and, and that's the way it has to be. But for those of us, and I consider myself... Um, uh, uh, having this as a luxury to think about all these disciplines and be able to pursue those levels of education. Let's do it, but let's do it with the positive force and with the philosophical mindset that is for the good of society and to help those who can't help themselves or don't have the means or the time or whatever the case may be, because time as well is is a luxury, a piece of luxurious item, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's what drives me. Um, going back to your original point about AGI versus Gen AI, I mean, I think we're far away from the point of singularity. Um, we, we don't even understand consciousness, our own level of consciousness, let alone, I think, get there. I think we're far away from it. I think LLMs are just tools that cannot um, cognitively understand what we understand. They don't have imagination. They don't have semantic context like we do. Um, sure, they can generate poetry, but it it so lacks flavor and and depth and right. And I think we're still far away from that that level. Mm -hmm. And yet we call it intelligence. We use that word. Uh, I, I can't know, isn't it crazy? <laughs> I can't remember who coined the word. It was a well known person, of course. But uh, it's, I, it's pre Turing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and I see. You know, like when I go on to OpenAI's site, so OpenAI is making ChatGPT and DALI, and they are on the pursuit of uh, AGI as well. I mean, they, they're quite open about it on their website. Uh, you know, in describing their new product, GPT-4, they use the term reasoning. They, they talk about the machine's reasoning capacity. Uh, you know, we how can a machine reason? Do, as you say, we don't understand consciousness. So... But people, people are being told that the machine can reason. And so therefore, I think a lot of people just don't know, you know, how to interpret that. And then, then they assume that because it's a powerful device, its output is based on reason. And so they're more likely to accept it. So maybe it's, is it a question of terminology that we have to get around? Uh, absolutely. It's a question of uh, semantic bullying and manipulation as well. So it's like this. Um, an illness is created such that by, by big companies, big pharma, if you want to call it, such that they'll come and say to you, but wait, we are your heroes. We have the antidote for it. So similarly, if we draw that here, that, that scenario, 
create the problem and then give the solution for it. And that's how I see this this as a as an unveiling. It, it's all it's all a play of words. I don't allow that to affect my mind because I know what they're doing. I know what they're going to say, but that's okay. We'll save you. We have, we can, we can tweak the tool this way, just buy into it. Right. So that, that's what we're facing. It's all manipulation and politics and drama. Mm -hmm. We have, we have to peel away from that. We have to be careful that we don't buy into it. And, and you know, these are powerful devices, of course. Uh, yes. The, and, and so they have attracted some regulatory discussion. I, I remember when GPT-3 first came out, uh, Italy banned it for a relatively short period of time, I think, very, uh, very over soon, yeah. Yeah, over concerns about uh, the device's access to private data. And now, of course, the New York Times is suing uh, OpenAI for use of copyrighted data or for training on copyrighted data. So there's definitely, I guess, some some regulatory response to this. I'm just wondering, you know, again, over your your two decade career in this area, what sort of trends you've seen in the regulatory responses? I mean, I guess the first kind of big uh, data privacy uh, revelation that I can re recall is Cambridge Analytica, which was maybe, yeah. what was that, 20, 2018, 2016? I, I can't even remember now. Seven years ago, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. Before GDPR, and GDPR came in around May 2018, yeah, exactly. That was the first yeah. time we woke up to it. But prior to that was the Solar Winds one, um, the energy companies, uh, and how that that uh, breach brought down grid after grid. Right, that one was quite alarming. But those were the two pivotal ones: one affecting the energy sector, and the other were affecting, you know, the dating and the personal personal side of things, where people individuals were affected quite deeply. Mm -hmm. But I would mark that as the markers in history as to when all this came un unraveling down and, and when all of us turned our attention to it. I mean, I was working in, in the privacy space without really understanding that I was working in the privacy space, so to speak, right? Because again, it was all from the medical perspective. It was all streamlined, you know, paperwork that we were doing to get consents and whatnot, but nothing like what we're seeing right now. I mean, some of you talked about um, surveillance and, and ad tracking and whatnot. I mean, just think about how complicated that arena is. I mean, those of us who are technologists have trouble understanding that, you know, when you're sitting there um, at a shoe store looking at shoes that in the background, your scrolling is being monitored and your habits are being sold at a general platform where Google's and other vendors of the world and coming and bidding on getting that data about you such that they can spit out at you again with, with different shoes and whatnot, right? But there's so much of this economy in the background that's happening and I'm just barely touching the surface because I'm trying to understand it it's so complicated mm -hmm. there's, there's no, no chance that the average person has at, at disseminating this and mm -hmm. it's, it's it's kept that complicated as such but I mean my my appeal to everybody is is self-educate learn learn and learn some more no matter how much I read I'm still behind and I'm reading constantly every day I just had to get my stronger lenses for my glasses right because my eyes are getting so affected it's it's coming yeah. down to that and I think the you know a lot of the issue is and, and I'm surprised since Cambridge Analytica that there hasn't been stronger rules for disclosure uh, in terms of what the algorithms are doing um, you know, like how do Google's alg algorithms produce recommendations, for example? I mean, there's this, you know, case Gonzalez versus Google now about how its algorithms were producing recommendations that promoted ISIS. And as a result, this person, Gonzalez, was killed in, in Paris attacks in 2015. So, you know, because the background to these algorithms isn't being disclosed, these things, I guess, are happening. And so it surprises me that in the you know years since Cambridge Analytica, that there hasn't been requirement of more disclosure of just what's going on in the background. As you say, you're, you're a professional working in the area. I don't work in the area. I do a little bit of research on my own. But honestly, I think the average person just has no clue what's going on in the background. No, they don't. FTC is now um, owning up to it, right? That's hence, hence the whole, the punitive measure of algorithmic disgorgement. I mean, they understand that these algorithms are being designed purposefully uh, as such, but then there are governments who are doing the same thing, right? For surveilling their, their citizens and surveilling others. Um, it's being done at um, the outer space level, 
with all the satellites that are surveilling us. It's beyond us. It's it's out of control. We If we control private sector, well, what about public sector? They're also guilty, right? And notice that a lot of these laws uh, governments are exempt from. That's so self-serving. You, nobody ever questions that either. You know, and I don't blame Googles and Metas of the world getting upset. It's like, hey, you come after us, but what about you? Well, no, 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 you know, we're exempt from all that. It's self-serving all across the board. Yeah, I guess that was a large part of the debate in the new EU AI Act was what the exemptions would be uh, allowed to the governments uh, from their own rules. So exactly. So there's and always there's a compromise. Large. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's by design so that they can surveil not only their own citizens, but those of other countries as well, right? And mm -hmm. impose their will. Mm -hmm. Hence, um, I think that colonialism is not only perpetuating, but at a larger rate, it's just digitized now. Mm -hmm. It's transformed in, in its pathway. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, back getting back to the question of AGI and this quest for a super intelligent machine, you know, which obviously I've said multiple times, it begs the question, how can a human program a machine to be smarter than a human? But setting that question aside, you know, pursuing this machine that has some sort of ability to exercise abstract um, abstractions, abstract reasoning, if we could call it reasoning. Um, sure. So we're on that path. So OpenAI, uh, you know, the maker of GPT, uh, it says that it's... Yeah, Sora. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Quite, quite uh, interesting, lifelike videos that Sora produces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then there's Google Bard and, you know, all sorts of, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so on this path, and, and, you know, I guess these chatbots are sort of the first step on this path to a super intelligent machine. What kind of concerns should users of these chatbots have with respect to their privacy and, and what sort of discussion is happening on this on this question? Um, there's a lot of discussion happening, especially at the corporate level, ever since the onset of chat GPT. And I mean, the bots were around well before chat GPT. It's just that the, that's the first one that was unleashed to the public at large prematurely. I have to say to Google's defense, they withheld releasing BART because they didn't think it was ready, where OpenAI took something that was half-baked and just threw it out there and said, hey, all of you, we're going to need your data. So we're just going to give you this amazing toy. Go play with it, right? Um, I think a lot of corporations, especially if not public at large, are aware that this is exactly what happened. We became the guinea pig. The public became the guinea pig. We started throwing our personal information in. We started, you know, talking about our psychological lack of well-being. We put our clinical notes and records up and said, hey, can you diagnose me, please? I mean, it's finally being un un unveiled as such. It was it was a farce. We got tricked. We got duped. And companies were saying, well, no more. You're not allowed to use chatbots. You know, for example, you know, a lot of companies are on Teams co-pilots um, licenses are being bought sparingly. Just a few executives have access to it. And I think that's a smart way to go about it until at least at the corporate level, um, the higher ups have an understanding of what it means for their employees to upload information, right? So it's rolling out well at that level. At a personal level, I'm still seeing, you know, for, for, between my social circle, friends and family using chat GPT at large, and using it as a golden word. And I keep reminding them, remember people, this is this was just trained on data up to 2021. It doesn't have X, so many tokens in it. It will loop back. It will give you hallucinating, confabulated results. And they just look at me and saying, you know, what, what language are you speaking? So again, when you start you're talking about parameters and tokens and neural networks and how fine tuning happens, people don't understand all that, right? And there are so, so many limitations to GPT 3.5, which is the free version available. Um, yeah, it's a tough one. It's a tough quagmire. And you mentioned Microsoft's co-pilot and Microsoft has an exclusive data arrangement with OpenAI, of course, and mm -hmm. is a major, it is OpenAI's major investor. So 49%. Yeah. You know, so I think it's, uh, you know, I guess there is reason to be concerned. I mean, we don't, with lack of disclosure as to what's happening with this data, I guess there's reason to be concerned. Um, I wanted to, so it's interesting that companies are constraining their use of chatbots. Uh, I guess you know probably to protect corporate secrets. Uh, if not per, outright banning chatbots, right, that's right. happening as well. Yeah, right. Interesting. 
but you know, as you say, individuals are using them. And you know, there was a case I think of a few years ago of a man in Belgium who was using a chatbot. He was depressed, and the chatbot encouraged him to think about committing suicide, which he did. Which he did. Which he did. Um, so I mean, there's clearly that sort of danger. I mean, I guess. I guess I mean I, I people are getting some experience in this now, and and I'm on record as saying that you know as you say. OpenAI came out with their product early and it was full of problems. It still is full of problems. It is. Uh, but I'm on record saying, well, you know, maybe there's a good side to that in the sense that it's giving us this exposure before the potential problems could become so huge. At least it's it's helping us to bring the problems out to the forefront now in yeah. a way that hopefully they can be addressed. But, you know, are, are the legal structures there to address the problems as they're coming well, out? They're not. They're yeah. not right because these yeah. there are no constraints around companies like OpenAI as to what they can and cannot release because there's no way, like you said earlier, can regulators keep up with this? It's just impossible. The technology is moving way, way too fast. Um, and in countries like Canada, so Wild Wild West, you can do whatever you want when it comes to uh, rolling out AI tools, right? Um, and yeah, it, it's it's pretty impressive piece of tech, and it can be scary. My um, I align with Mustafa Suleiman in his new book, The Coming Wave, where he says it's a matter of containment. Um, I'm a techno optimist. I say we embrace these tools with the understandings that you and I have talked about and with the view that, and, and for us, because we do have a voice, so I do at least to a certain extent on LinkedIn, you do through your two podcasts on LinkedIn, through your, your blogging. And that containment should be something that should be built in as these tools roll out, right? There has to be a plug that needs to be pulled should things go out of control. You can't just let that these tools run rampant, especially eventually when we come close to singularity. I think we're not even anywhere an iota of being close to it, but it will happen eventually, right? Where is that plug? Where is the containment measures? Where are they? They need to be built in. The nuclear industry has them, right? Hmm. Um, not perfect, but it's there. So we can build that here as well. Mm -hmm. And I think Elon Musk himself at one point was calling for nuclear level controls over right. over AI. Yeah, and and you're right. I mean, it's the controls aren't there. I mean, I guess there's an assumption that we can always control these tools, and that the people making them can control the tools. But maybe they're going to lose control at some point, or we just simply don't know. We don't have enough information. No, to they know. won't, because because the governments are driving them, right? And yeah. at the end of the day, the government does want control over over everything yeah. else. I mean, we need to we need to see it from that perspective. You've got some very key players who are driving all of this. The containment will be there. That red button will be there. It's a matter of what we will be told to perceive it as. If we are fed the narrative as in, in the brave new world, it, 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 it's, not, it's not in your controls, out of your hands, then we will believe it as such, right? Except for those of us who can actually push the limits and push the envelope and say, well, no, I know how it works. I know you could have built in containment because you designed it, right? Where is the containment measure? Where's your red button? It has to be there. It has to. It has to be a plug. They're not going to let it get out of control. You know that. Mm -hmm. it, it's yeah. it's it's not self-serving then. Yeah, it it's. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, but then again, we're in a year where it, the year 2024, when half the planet is going to be heading to the polls to vote. Yes, it's a scary uh, year. Yeah, and and these technological tools are being used in a way that you know presumably is going to try right. to distort people's opinions as they as they, you know, was evident in the last U.S. federal election. Yes. Um, what drama that was. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it's, uh, I mean, the red button's there, but I guess who's going to control the red button is is the question maybe. And, and then at what point is there a threat to the imagination? Is there a threat to the human imagination? I mean, we, we talked about how, you know, the machine doesn't have imagination. The machine can't reason, but, is the use of this technology threatening the human imagination in the meantime? Yeah, it is. It's numbing our brains. It's it's the elixir that the key players want you to be drunk on, right? So that you don't think. It's making us uh, anti-Aristilian, anti-Platonian. Any, you know, it's it's causing us to become 
mainstream. And that is frightening. To me, that's the most frightening piece to become part of status quo, to be robbed of our identity, because it's easy to go to chat GPT and let it do the thinking for us, right? I'm saying fight that, but be a techno optimist. And I'm asking a lot, as I speak, I sound unreasonable to myself. But I'm saying somehow find a balance and embrace all of that. Maintain your identity, maintain your cognitive independence, maintain your imagination, but at the same time, learn how to use these tools to your own benefit, to the benefit of protecting your loved ones and those around you, but for the benefit of society at large too. It's it's a it's a tough mix. But yes, you are you are right. I, I'm afraid we're going to lose the creators, right, the, those who write really well. I'm afraid that we won't produce any more roomies uh, of the world. You know, my my favorite poet. I am worried about that a lot. And I think, I mean, I worry about the, you know, the generation that I'm part of. Uh, but I think especially about the young generation that are they learning the skills that they will need to be able to think mm -hmm. creatively, independently, um, yeah. in ways that don't necessarily follow the the established trends, you know, are they going to get caught up in some sort of giant feedback loop as a result of this? And yeah. I think it's, and I, I think it's it's that generation, it's the young generation that is still learning. They're they're still forming their ideas that are especially at risk. I think from this, especially at risk at risk of a lot of mental illness, um, for sure. I'm scared that we won't have any more Sinatras anymore, right? I'm scared there won't be any more the Bronte sisters and Shakespeare. And, and I think those are all bygones. That to me is a real catastrophe. And uh, one that is going to leave a huge gap as we continue to make history and contend with the future, right? Mm -hmm. This generation is going to suffer quite a bit at large and is not going to be able to write history books as our forefathers and mothers have. I mean, you, you said that you're a techno optimist and I don't want to make this all doom and gloom. Um, I mean, I guess a couple of questions on where we go from here. First of all, how do we get conversations like this to expand and, and really take on a critical mass on a global scale? Like what, what do you think is the best avenue for this discussion to really take grip and to really have some sort of concrete results? Yeah, I think a lot about this. So for example, I think access to internet is a human right, absolutely. That needs to be made free. It needs to be made available to every village, every tiny dot on the map on this planet, number one. Number two, I think educational materials via YouTube need to be made free and encouraged to watch. So for example, that wonderful documentary on AlphaGo, the game um, that DeepMind came up with, right? That Demis Haspis drove. I mean, it's such an eye-opener. It helps you understand at a fundamental level of what LLMs can do and how self-learning works in a, in a, in a very little bite-sized broken down pieces. If, if, if documentaries like that can be made available to public at large and they can be shown in classrooms as part of main curriculum, I think we have a lot of optimism and that's what drives me. And that's why I am a techno-optimist, right? I use the analogy of a scissor. So when scissors were introduced, when seatbelts were introduced, you know, our humanity fought back a little bit, but we learned how to adjust. We learned how to use those tools wisely. Yes, we still face dangers of the crazies out there who use it, misuse them. But at large, society did conform for the positive. I do believe that can happen again, but it goes down to resetting our mind, i.e. having access to internet everywhere we move. In Canada, for example, so many Aboriginal communities don't have access to 5G, right? I mean, let alone any level of broadband, broadband out there. There isn't anything available. I mean, we need Elon Musk to let loose his starlings out here, right? So we need more of that. And I'm not saying Elon Musk has his, his, his business needs to be given any more credence, but others can come up with things like that. So again, back to the same theme, I think it is education and have it made mm -hmm. freely available to the population at large. And those are really two powerful suggestions. I think access to internet should be a human right. Right. Because I mean, how can we function without it now, right? It's it's you can't. You can't it's yeah. like I need to buy a loaf of bread and I need to pay my internet bill. I, yeah. I have to. Yeah. And there are people who are paying the internet bill before they're actually buying groceries. Yeah. It's come down to that, and that yeah. is a huge uh, catastrophe yeah. for 
people's socioeconomic well-being because they are paying the internet bill before they're paying their rent, for example, yeah. or somehow adjusting their um, budgeting. I think countries like Canada should make it free. You made healthcare yeah. free, which is broken for the most part, but you made that free, make yeah. this free as well. And please yeah. let um, socioeconomically um, vulnerable, deprived communities have access to it for free. Why are Aboriginal communities exempt from all that? It's unfair. Yeah, it, it creates great inequalities for those who don't have access I design, to it. Yeah. I design, and the societies are broken, being broken up that way. In the U.S., you have a, a lot of poverty. There's a huge broadband of people who are impoverished, who don't have access to internet. For such a rich country, it's actually quite a poor country as well when it comes to intellect. That's why there's so much intellect being flown in, right? Mm -hmm. Like this, there are problems all over the world, except for countries that do have Starlink satellites hang, hovering over them thanks to Elon Musk in that regard, right? They are having access to internet, but that's my main giveaway mm -hmm. here is make the internet free globally, mm -hmm. such that every corner of every society, every aspect of humanity has access to it. But then you need the devices for the internet to run on, right? So that's the other issue. The media needs to be there. The medium, yeah. I should say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and then as you say, I mean the other suggestion, the free educational content. I mean, there's such wonderful content on the internet. Amazing. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, and I give credit to a lot of it. I mean, especially things like Wikipedia. You know, I I give such credit to Jimmy Wells for making right. that a free service when it was proposed. Uh, you know, he was being lobbied. I understand to monetize it, to commercialize it. Can you imagine what it would be like if it was a commercial product instead of a free product? I mean, my goodness, the amount of information I have obtained from Wikipedia, I mean, it's not that it's perfectly reliable, but it points you in the right direction. And so if you approach it with a little bit of skepticism, at least it it gives you the broad outline of the thing exactly. that you're it's looking at. a great at. starting point. I, yeah. I agree. And yeah. like that, a lot of universities have made their treatises available for free. I mean, I'm I'm at Stanford U's site all the time. I'm in Princeton all the time mm -hmm. looking at, for example, the AI Institute in, in Stanford. They actually release their treatises for free at large to read. I don't know where I'd be without all of that. You're right. Yeah. I guess in terms of positive trends, these are a couple of things that we're looking at. And as you said, I guess right. it's a question of mindset, you know, just establishing a positive mindset that will hopefully percolate through government and industry so that decisions that are made will help humans to be human. But I think what people yeah. at large should, who are for whoever's listening to this conversation, should take away is that don't be fooled. Inequality has deep, deep divides right now, right? Our deep division right now is happening within our society. It's very much hidden. It's very subtle. It's a digital divide that's happening within society. As ethicists, we need to be aware of this and bring it to the forefront. And we need we need to allow that to drive the, the conversation as well. What would you say to the average citizen who, I guess, you know, we've, we've talked about all of the problems, we've talked about how people are not empowered with knowledge about what's going on. You know, so say the average citizen listening to this conversation comes to you and says, you know, Saima, I'm concerned about this, but I don't know what to do. I, I Where should I start in terms of protecting myself, informing myself? What is the average person supposed to do? The average person needs to be empowered to ask questions, not be afraid to, first of all. You won't get the right answers if you don't ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. And just asking the right question is what a lot of people are afraid to do. So the average person needs to be empowered by the understanding that they have the freedom to do so, number one. Um, Canada is a basket full of different ethnicities. I mean, the country is as beautiful as it is due to different ethnic backgrounds. And a lot of ethnic backgrounds uh, frown upon questioning of what we consider superior, um, those folks in the superior statuses, that needs to break down. Socio constructs need to break in society at large. You know, we don't need to kowtow and bow down to those who are doctors and lawyers and accountants and engineers and whatnot. All of that needs to go away. The fabric needs to change. This is what I'm, I'm going to go back to saying this again. What AI has done is brought all those insecurities, all that ugliness that humanity was constructed on to the forefront. We need to break those barriers. We need to set a level play, playing field. And there are going to be a lot of actors out there who are not going to want that because society is built on these discrepancies, right? Um, but my, I mentor a lot 
Um, I mentor, I go out of my way to mentor people who are new to the country and are entering the fields, the STEM fields. And the first thing I tell them is number one, be at ease with me. Number two, ask me anything anything. If I don't have the answers, more than likely I won't. I will guide you the right way and I will connect you to the right people. That's what we need to be able to offer um, to society at large. And we need to find people, people like you and myself who are privileged to have access to such knowledge. We need to find those who are not and offer such knowledge and, and do knowledge share for free. And that's why I loved LinkedIn so much because I can do those knowledge share for anybody who's willing to listen and learn and say, hey, guess what I learned today? Here it is. Here you go. I, yeah. I, I hope you're empowered just like I am, right? So we need that kind of sentiment to radiate at large. And, and that's a, LinkedIn is a great example because that's how you and I connected. So that's right. Exactly. Yeah. Just and, not every role yeah. I've gotten, um, James, in this space within the the data privacy cybersecurity space has been through LinkedIn, through letting people know I'm here, willing to learn, willing to contribute, right? And and that's how we increase our circle exponentially. Mm -hmm. So in Canada in 2024, we're not scheduled to go into an election, although we might find ourselves in one with a minority government. But if you were in a democratic country that's casting a vote this year, is there one question that you would ask the candidate before you cast a vote about privacy, about about this whole space? Because it, we, we don't hear this as election issues. I mean, election issues tend to be about economics and defense and you know global affairs and all of this, but we don't really hear this discussion happening when people cast votes. Yeah, I think you're right. Privacy and uh, cybersecurity are not the forefront uh, conversation pieces. I think the wording needs to be changed. I think the rhetoric needs to be changed and the word trust needs to come in instead um, because that's the underlying foundation to why privacy and cybersecurity drives are there. So I think if the public at large says, what are you doing for me to trust you? If that question is asked, and, and then if the answers are given, well, we're going to force companies uh, like the, the, the FANG companies to be accountable to you. Well, how are you doing that? And if that kind of conversation can be driven with the premise that what are you doing to protect or cause me to trust you, I think that can change the narrative. But even that awareness isn't there for the public at large, right? Because they blindly trust, again, going back to those who are in authoritative positions. And we need to break that fabric. We need to cut that fabric in pieces with I that like... proverbial scissor that I talked about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I like that. It, it, I hadn't really thought about that question of putting that trust question in the forefront. I think that that could really spark an interesting discussion. And, well, and isn't you know, that what it's coming yeah. down to for all yeah. companies who are in, involved yeah. in e commerce, right? Yeah. We will encrypt your data end to end. We will mask your credit card numbers. We will not retain your credit card numbers after you make your purchase. You will have to re-input that. When I see that kind of dialogue happening, I'm like, yeah, okay, good. I can, I can, I can do commerce with you, right? If my credit card is safe by default, then I have issues. So it comes down to trust. What are you going to do for me to trust you? Tell me. Five things right now. And the politicians need to be asked that question. And when we spend so much of our daily time online, I mean, I was looking at stats and I, I don't know, the average person spends something like six hours a day surfing online. Uh, when you spend so much time, like you want to know what trust is involved in that time, in that portion, you know, that might be one quarter of your entire day. If there's no trust in that one quarter of your day, you're, you're in trouble. Exactly. Especially during, during COVID. I mean, you were doing your medical appointments online. You were divulging the most sensitive of informations online constantly. Yeah. And, and trust was violated hugely yeah. during that time period. And I think people are awake to it. They are mm -hmm. seeing that now. And with the amount of breaches that we're seeing every single day, whether that's hospitals, universities, banks, you name it, it's happening. Right. And that's the other reason, going back to your initial question, when our conversation began, why not maintain your data to the best you can? Well, because there are a lot of these breaches happening. So don't feed more into the system if you don't have to. Or wherever you're going to do commerce, make sure you do it with those who you can trust. What does trust mean? So again, and then there's the education piece. Well, trust can be broken down into different tools, 
that they're saying that they're using? Are they encrypting your data? What does encryption mean, right? There's so much to unpack. There's so much education that's required. Um, there's a lot, a lot of work to do in that regard. Yeah, trust is so critical and nobody is immune from breaches. I mean, governments are being, as you say, governments, hospitals, largest corporations. And then I think every consumer, I hate to, I won't use the word user, every consumer, whatever you're consuming, should be guarding their data as best as they can. Check your bank statements every month. Check your credit card statements. No longer can you trust things blindly anymore. I mean, I've had purchases made on my card in Africa and India. Had I not been looking, right, I would have let that mm -hmm. go. Our credit card numbers are out there. Yeah, me too. Me too. We've all gone through it. It's a pain. Yeah. And yeah. then you have to deal with it. Yeah, I mean, I guess we're kind of coming back to the beginning of the discussion. Why does privacy matter? And I think it's, I've learned actually quite a bit more than I thought about that during the course of our discussion. I think it, there's so much involved here, so much complexity. And I guess that's the problem is, is that it's such a complex area. But the more discussions like this that happen, I, I hope that, you know, the more people will come to appreciate privacy yeah. and become active in privacy. And I'm not saying become a techno optimist. I'm not saying become nihilistic. I'm not saying let go of the technologies. I'm just saying find a balance. So for example, I'm wearing a good old analog watch. I love it. It's beautiful. It's fashionable. I don't need to wear my smartwatch all the time. I have one. I wear it when I go to sleep just to measure my own metrics. And, and yes, I do realize I'm feeding into that ecosystem and, and when I'm exercising because I'm extremely active, but I will not wear it 24 seven. I'll balance that interest out, right? Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say is find a, a medium ground and learn about what you're using. If you're going to wear wearables, for example, if you're going to be connecting all your devices, if you're going to engage in your fridge telling you whether you're out of milk or not, just be aware of what the consequences of that are. If you're going to have Siri and Alexa in your home telling you what the weather is, be aware that they're listening to you and feeding your sound bites back to, you know, mothership. Yeah. yeah. Value your human agency, I would say, really is, you know, you're a human and, and you value yeah. that and, yeah, and yeah, protect try to, it. Try to be as autonomous as possible mm. and uh, find a balance where you're not totally isolating yourself from society because we are technologically driven. It's a tough one. We're living in tough times in that regard. Tough times, interesting times, so much potential, I guess, to... So much potential. It's so exciting. Yeah. I, I am yeah. just over the moon yeah. about all of yeah. this. I find it super yeah. exciting. Well, that's great. And, and I appreciate so much your, your talking about this. I would really like to follow up on this and see how oh, it evolves that. to see how the EU AI Act uh, evolves, for example, and yeah. other things coming down the pipe. So yeah, it would be and really I'd interesting. I'd to come back and, yep, and share some of my experiences with you. I'm teaching yeah. quite a bit. I um, just taught yeah. at University of Illinois and Northeastern University. I'm going to be heading off to CMU as well, my alma mater, yeah. and University of Toronto as well, teaching there at engineering and whatnot. And, you know, yeah. it's amazing to interact with students and see the questions they ask you. And then I realize that I'm, st I'm yet a student myself. It's a wonderful feeling so yeah it's be great to carry on this conversation great. let's share in that so so thank you Simon, very much for being here today and i look forward to yeah. our next discussion yeah amazing thank you okay thank you our thanks go to today's guest and to you for listening to the quantum feedback loop please subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts and don't forget to check out the quantum record at thequantumrecord.com the quantum record is a monthly journal of philosophy science technology and time where you'll find the latest developments in our rapidly evolving technological world.